Hello everyone, I'm DC. Welcome to the channel. I hope you're all well, having a great day or night wherever you are. Tonight I'm going to take you through a conversation I recently had with uh, Professor Bart Kay. Um, we're going to talk about all things carnival, getting started and some of the more advanced tips to uh, help you get through and transition into a, a healthy lifestyle. So without further ado, I shall bring you Professor Bart Kay who can explain to you a whole lot more than I do. Um, I know many people are familiar with Professor Bart Kay, um, but can you just give us a rundown of your history, your qualifications and um, your experience? Yes. I am a former senior academic, now permanently retired from the lofty realms of academia for personal reasons more than anything else, um, and financial too, actually, because you don't get to earn very much, even as a quite senior academic, it turns out there is kind of a limit to what, you know, you can you can get there, really. Although there's no set limit, uh, in effect, there is for each individual based on all sorts of things. Um, so after 20 years, I'd had enough of being an academic, and I retired at the rank of Professor of Health Science. Specifically, throughout my career, I specialised in the physiology of rest and exercise, human nutrition, and cardiovascular pathophysiology, as in the causes of heart disease and all that kind of stuff, all overarched, of course, by research design and statistics expertise in making these inferences and doing science and stuff. Uh, undertook a number of multi-million dollar um consultancies externally to the university while i was employed as an academic uh, unfortunately for those you don't get paid those millions yourself those millions go to the institution and you still get your salary but you get kudos and you get to put on your cv i did several multi-million dollar consultancies just to name drop a couple of those the nrl referees association a few years back yeah um the Australian Defence Force, pretty big organisation. Yeah. Uh, the New Zealand Defence Force, specifically the Army at one point, and um, a little rugby team called the All Blacks at one point right. as well. So yeah. a bit of that. Um, published a few articles in my time. Um, nothing spectacular or to write home about, but, uh, you know, it, it, just places me at the level of someone who has contributed significantly to the peer reviewed literature as first author, first investigator, as scientist. That's me in a nutshell, really. Um, yeah. yeah, pretty much yeah. that covers it. Mm. Yeah, yeah, very impressive resume. Can you speak about the uh, consultancy you did with the Defence Forces? Are they? Yep. Yep, yeah. I can I can speak generally about the topic and about what it was that we were doing there. Obviously, you know, whether or not the actual results are now unclassified or still classified, I don't know. However, okay. what the task was, was basically to have a look at the physical fitness testing policies and procedures that the Defence Force had in terms of declaring personnel fit for active duty or otherwise. Okay. So All there right. was a general fitness test and a battle efficiency test. The general fitness was the baseline. All members of the Defence Force must maintain this level of fitness. The battle efficiency test was a bit tougher again. Obviously, you can't put guys out there in harm's way who can't handle themselves in that situation. So the Defence Force wanted to look at the battery of tests that they were doing and comment on their robustitude, correctness, indication or contraindication, thus to formulate new fitness employment standards for the Defence Force. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And that included aspects of physiology, rest and recovery, nutrition, the whole package. Yeah. Um, and I think the whole thing from memory was six or eight million Australian dollars that was invested in that project. And uh, and I played a role in that. Okay. Mm. 
Yeah, so basically, yeah, uh, like the, every aspect of training uh, a battle athlete. Yeah, mm. excellent. Yeah, okay. so that was really um, interesting. Yeah, anyway. that would be. I was thinking, yeah, that would be brilliant, actually. All right, so let's get into like some of the general things um, I want to talk about a lot of, you know, especially with carnival. Yeah. Um, now, you're a very strong advocate for carnival diet. How did you come to that yourself? Oh, you've been doing this for nine, ten years. There are about, yeah, yeah, so something like that. Guesstimation. Before that, I mean, there's a lot of doctors out there who, I mean, well, they label they're labeled. Well, I suppose they're qualified as doctors, but they absolutely refuse to uh, deviate from the standard guidelines of of diet or uh, dietitians or, mm. or diet mm. per se. Mm. So how did you yourself come to Carnival? Right. I heard about it as something that people were doing as this newfangled thing, which it turns out we've been doing for about four and a half million years, so there's nothing new about it. Yeah, at least. <laughs> it made sense to me when I heard about people going, oh, well, that makes sense, because I'd actually been following a basically pseudo-ketogenic low carbohydrate approach to nutrition for about 27 years before that yeah and so this was an evolution that uh, i don't know why i never made it myself until someone suggested it to me i don't know but when it was suggested it was like that it makes sense i'm prepared to give that a trial and see you know whether or not there is a catastrophic health failure of any kind that occurs as a result of doing that um and as we say nine nine and a half maybe 10 years later i can't remember i didn't write it down in a diary what my date of starting was yeah. um but anyway i'm still waiting for a negative outcome from eating basically nothing but meat animal fat um i haven't been 100 percent. i will tell you that um there are carnivores who've been 100 percent for decades and good luck to them I have had the occasional off-piste thing here and there. I'm going to, again, closely guesstimate at around 95% adherence. Yeah. So that's kind of where well, I am. That's what I do with my diet. I suggest that 100% is optimal. Yeah. But to give you full disclosure, I too am a human being. <laughs> and, you know, we have changed our environment so vastly in the last even 100 years that we've placed ourselves in a completely alien environment and as such our systems that would normally protect us from these kind of things don't work we, we haven't evolved an effective defense against the complete lack of satiety signaling that you'll get with carbohydrates for example yeah yeah so mm. so where do you stand on um like basically the standard uh guidelines would tell us that calories in calories out it, it's all about a measuring measuring our macros mm. um so they generally speak out of nutrients as a whole as uh such as vitamins like they'll say vitamin k or vitamin d or protein as, it, as if it's all exactly the same mm. right like um the fact that you you know you get k1 from plants it doesn't mean that you can absorb that mm. or that your body can actually t uh, change that into k2 right all right so where do you stand on on that well i mean there are a number of examples of that another example is beta carotene through to retinol yeah there's a very low capacity to achieve that um the the epa dha conversion rate yeah very very poor there are a number of nutrients in the correct form for us already existing and you'll find them in plant and uh, not in plants you will find them in animals goodness <laughs> you will not find them in plants you will find plant well, versions. Let's edit that one out before the vegans well, uh, set you up. <laughs> yeah you won't you won't find them in plants let's be clear you will find them in animals not in plants the plant versions are suitable sources for plants yeah. and it behooves plants to evolve 
nutrients in this form that are vastly less available to animals precisely in order to encourage more animals to eat each other yeah sort of thing um so that's the situation there on, on many of those kind of nutrients this term phytonutrients that we supposedly need every day mm. this is this is an invention this is a propaganda term phytonutrients that sounds fantastic doesn't it yeah. goodness gracious we better get some phytonutrients because we're told we need them every day well most of the nutrients and plants are not particularly available as we've discussed yeah. they're also laced mostly with poisons of various kinds endocrine disruptors of various kinds um, directly toxic physically damaging substances like oxalates um proteins that can mess up signaling in all sorts of ways yeah. Yeah, lectins etc for example you know all these kind of things that that plants yeah. have evolved in order to discourage animals from eating them yeah so that's where i stand on that that's kind of the logic behind it that is also underpinned and bolstered i guess by the anecdotal experience of my own whereby removing plants from my diet entirely leads to vast vast benefit in my day-to-day -day health disposition everything putting plants back in in any amount causes precipitous decreases in my goodness coefficient for want of a better term yeah. add to that that there are tens and hundreds of thousands of others whose anecdotes mirror my own it's almost like we've got a data set yeah. sure it's a naturalistic observation data set without all the clever tricks it wasn't collected under any sort of discipline it's a set of anecdotes but at the end of the day the only difference between data and a set of anecdotes is the discipline under which it's collected yeah and epidemiology has no discipline of data collection either yeah. so that's just a pile of anecdotes so we've got one too it seems to work well well it seems to be i mean there seems to be a lot of people coming out and uh you know sharing their experiences of um not not only thriving but healing so um i think there's definitely got to i mean it has to be something to it you can't get that you can't get that many people in a controlled environment to to, to do a study anyway uh, we just all so. brainwashed liars anyway apparently according to to the antithesists <laughs> yeah and we're all we're all paid by big meat apparently oh, yeah. i'm in i'm in big meat's pocket me yeah i'm still waiting for my check big meat um but the generalization of vitamins and nutrients and things like that that these people um so-called influencers and mm. vegan doctors they always generalize you know vitamin k vitamin you know d and all this sort of stuff they don't actually go into the specific molecule correct because they know that it, they have nothing to well i think they know this they know that it, it just uh the body just can't absorb these things so mm. Yeah. anyway yeah so another concern most people have when they go to the um to carnivore diet is cholesterol yeah. and recently there was a study came out uh that oreos lower your cholesterol um better than statins for example mm. um now uh, of course a lot of people have heard some of the horror stories of statins um mm. and should hopefully avoid them with at all cost but then they get concerned about high cholesterol because apparently high cholesterol is a bad thing mm -hmm. um how i understand that study is that the leaner you get the more weight you lose on a low carb diet you are when you become fat adapted you are your liver is um using fat as energy so therefore it decrease uh let me see low carb in leaner people lead to decrease in liver uh, glycogen um, so energy uh, needs to be produced from the liver um, in the form of fat okay so more fat means more lipids and lipids are transported for fat yeah so therefore your cholesterol and they to count cholesterol they are basically counting lipids lipoproteins so therefore your, your transporters go up is that correct 
Well, I think we need to devolve the whole discussion several steps. Yeah. We need to go back to the very most basic fundamental issue here. The issue here is that we are being told, we are being expected to accept a statement, an authoritative statement of fact made by certain people in the literature, shall we say, yeah. stating that a certain fraction of the lipoprotein carriers of lipids that transport lipids around in our blood, somehow a certain subpopulation of these lipoproteins somehow causes heart disease, atherosclerosis to occur in some way. Yeah. It's a begging the question fallacy because what we are expected to do is just accept this mechanistic cause and effect relationship between lipoproteins and heart disease in some way. And now we should move on to how best to lower this dangerous lipoprotein that our body created under the instruction of our genes, those genes having survived something like around 13,000 million years. There seems to be a hole in this logic somewhere. Yeah. And there it is. Yeah. Your blood cholesterol level right now is exactly what it ought to be. Your genes know exactly what they are doing in that regard. You will yeah. produce and or break down, ergo, the balance of the level or concentration of the lipoproteins in your blood is responsive to changes in environment including what is in your blood that needs carrying or what is being added to your blood for carriage. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I, I don't, I mean, myself, I only have blood tests because of my condition. Uh, apart from that, I really don't uh, see the need for doing that. Mm. And, uh, you know, everyone is just so scared about cholesterol because of all the, the, the garbage that goes on about it. Yeah. Um, and I, I keep telling people the higher, you know, high cholesterol doesn't mean it's going to, it's not an adverse effect. There's Correct. certainly not a market that you should be um, worried about. And if mm -hmm. anything, it's a positive thing. Mm -hmm. Cholesterol <clears throat> also produces um, your, you know, uh, hormones such as testosterone and D3 as, as a, uh, a hormone. So how can that be a bad thing? How can your body over time has always produced more cholesterol for in response for you know, nutrients and uh, hormones. Mm. How can it suddenly, all of a sudden, now be bad for your heart? Mm. So, well, yeah. The the short answer, the scientifically correct, absolutely unassailable position to take on this topic is as follows: there is no evidence extant in the literature or anywhere else indicating a cause and effect relationship between cholesterol or any of the lipoprotein carriers of lipid or any subfraction of those lipoproteins or any particle number size count or anything else and heart yeah. disease no cause and effect evidence exists anywhere yeah, yeah. that's the unassailable position then yeah. we have to build an argument that would bolster and support our position statement around the likelihood that it is completely innocent and not involved causally but we can no more prove it is not involved than they can prove it is all we yeah. can then do is build an argument that says here are the reasons why we are suggesting it is not the cause and here's some pretty powerful ones just for fun let's i'll throw them at you real quick atherosclerosis occur in the arteries entirely and never ever in the veins yeah do the veins carry blood which is different from the arteries no it's the no. same blood yeah there's the end of your cause and effect obviously this proves that it, you know all their arguments straight away doesn't it oh, to which they respond by saying well it's necessary but not sufficient <laughs> so we should say well okay prove it's necessary yeah show me a chart which shows that a person with no cholesterol suffers 
no heart disease and someone with lots of cholesterol suffers lots of heart disease on average large groups of people and that might be interesting that doesn't it seems it doesn't yeah it also either. seems um that lowering your cholesterol to a certain amount is a very dangerous thing to happen as well um well that was my next reason. point if you get your yeah. cholesterol to zero uh, what you'll find is the next thing you'll be needing is a box exactly exactly um low cholesterol diets will, will cause a lot more damage than anything else right okay oh, right. so now if we look at two very large associative data sets now we understand that association is not causation but geez it's interesting when you have very very large data sets to look at trends yeah so let's look at the data collected by the world health organization as regards mortality rates in 168 different countries and territories around the world and let's correlate that data on a chart with the British Heart Foundation data on the cholesterol levels in the serum of people in those same 168 countries. This is not a published data set in a paper. This is two independent data sets put together. And there's so much data that we're, what we're talking about is billions of person years of follow up. Here's what you get. Talking total cholesterol here. And from that, you'll have to infer different lipoprotein fractions and things. This is just total yeah. cholesterol data. Fine. 220 milligrams per deciliter is the lowest incidence of mortality from all causes and cancer and heart disease and diabetic complications, all of them. Yeah. Okay. When you drop the total cholesterol below 220, 210, 200, well, you know, there is a steep increase in mortality from all causes and every single contributory cause associated with that reduction in the LDL cholesterol. Yeah. Oh dear. Yeah. Whoops. There's, you know, correlation is not causation, but, you know, over the last hundred years, for example, the less meat people have eaten, um, you know, there's, I mean, there's also a direct reverse correlation. like. People have been eating less meat and heart disease has been going up. Yeah. Right? So, you know, there's there's absolutely no evidence to, or there's actually ample evidence to prove that even though it's not, like I said, like causation and correlation doesn't sort of connect. But in, when there's a, a reverse correlation like that, obviously there's no evidence to support anything that, um, you know, eating meat is going to cause any kind of heart disease. Right. Um, now the oreo study would prove obviously prove that adding carbohydrates would lower obviously because you're you're getting sugar energy therefore you're not producing as much fat energy so lowering eating carbohydrates will lower uh, okay. uh cholesterol what what we need to understand about that paper that oreos paper is that, that was a paper that nick wrote with yep. one other co-author it's n equals one it's one subject it's nick yeah himself yeah. was the subject okay? okay his study therefore proves nothing whatever except what was observed in nick at that time under those conditions that nick has been adhering to whatever they may be nothing else you cannot generalize that to get statistical power you need a large sample size you need an experimental subpopulation you need a control population they need to be genotypically phenotypically identical or as close to that as possible at the outset we need to vary only one thing and we need to do this in random crossover if we're going to compare one thing versus another thing now you can't random order crossover with yourself because unless you can travel in time that's impossible so this study is a conversation starter around geez isn't that amazing that it seems that the level of lipids in the blood has reacted to the food that's coming into the blood in such a way as to marshal its resources and not produce as much carrier for lipid if you're not consuming as much lipid well really i'm shocked <laughs> i'm truly <laughs> shocked but no um no. that's all it is it's a conversation starter and we need to not get yeah. too over excited about it i think because yeah. if, if we do if we do 
say, oh, look, here's a, here's a study that proves absolutely that Oreos are better than statins. There's, yeah. there's several issues with that. Number one, no, the study doesn't show that because it's n equals one. Yeah. Two, who's to say that lowering your cholesterol more so rather than less so is better or good or indicated? Because we already know it isn't. Yeah. We've just established that it's very likely that it's actually the inverse. You drop your cholesterol at your peril, it seems. A reverse causation is the next cry. You'll hear that. Oh, it's reverse causation. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah that's, I agree. I, I, I recently spoke to uh, Zoe Harkham, and, hmm. you know, she, she is the same. Like, dietary cholesterol has nothing to do with um, blood, blood cholesterol. Hmm. Um, and except that that might, I mean, fluctuate with, you know, if you're fat adapted, for example, then obviously you need more transporters in your blood. Mm. Um, but that would be about it. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's, that's my take on it anyway. But, you know, you see this Oreo study going around at the moment that, you know, of course everyone latches onto it and they see something come out like that. So. Mm. Um, yeah, it's it's a bit sensationalist, and I get why they did it. I get why Nick published yeah. that paper. I understand what he's trying to achieve in terms of the publicity thing, but I also think that what he's doing and so doing by publishing that paper is actually potentially damaging his own reputation as a scientist. Yeah, and I don't think that's a good idea, personally. Yeah, what he should have yeah, done really was do use that. Study on what one what he should have done is use that data as hypothesis generating and go and do the study properly. And yeah. then report it, yeah. but whatever. I wasn't asked for my <laughs> advice. Yeah, well, I don't it expect is to be now. either because I've been quite um, critical of the efforts of the LMHR team and the whole thing, and I think quite rightly so, actually. Oh, but yeah. that's for, possibly for another day. Yeah, yeah, that could take a while. Mm. Okay, so that is a great example from Bart. You cannot get excited about a paper, you know, and, you know, people on both sides do this all over the different things, different subjects. Someone writes a paper, they don't do a study, a control study, a proper study, and, and quite often, quite frankly, there just isn't any. The term, when, they, when people tell you that 99% of scientists will, you know, agree with whoever's funding them, then that's not just a joke. It's actually fact, all right? That it's just the, the way it is. So there actually is not a real study in um, like a controlled study for nutrition, for example, for and for a lot of things. You'd be surprised about. All right, so we'll continue. All right. Let's talk about some of the benefits of meat. You know, there's a lot of people keep complain about you know you know meat has this and that and you know it's saturated fat and all this other garbage but mm. uh recently a study came out of chicago university about uh, uh long chain fatty acids that actually fight cancer yeah among other things mm. do you know much about that study at all not a lot i did see the headline and i thought that's interesting and i wonder how it was done i suspect it was an in vitro lab controlled situation on cells excised from a free living individual and kept under controlled circumstances in a lab yeah. which would enable a better reductive association of two variables however in so doing remove those two variables from any other extraneous inputs control levers that affect those things in the real world so as such while i rail against people saying here is some associative and loose poorly controlled pseudo clinical stuff which may purport to support a cause and effect relationship between cholesterol and heart disease and i say no absolutely unacceptable I can't then turn around and say, well, look, this is interesting. Here's a thing that suggests that there might be a relationship between cancer cells in a lab yeah. and this particular chain length fatty acid. It cures cancer. It cures cancer now. No, that would be just yeah. as bad on my part. That would be just as inappropriate. So I'm not going to do that. Yeah. But I'm going to say, geez, that's interesting and probably could do with more looking at. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, I guess a lot of, like you're saying, you know, a lot of these things, they, they come out and uh they do warrant more investigation certainly uh, looking at but um 
as far as long-term studies, then that, that doesn't really have uh, a lot of weight with it. Mm. But there's not, I don't think there's any real nutritional study that does. Um, really. Well, here's the thing. A lot of people want to authoritatively and arrogantly assert with quite stunning self-confidence about what is absolutely known about the long-term effects of eating this, that, or the other thing on your health. Yeah. To which, you know, the only responsible response is to go, well, can you show me some studies that underpin that claim of cause and effect? Long-term yeah. studies with human beings as subjects, groups of genetically identical human beings separated at birth or before, kept in labs under controlled situations their entire lives, and the only thing allowed to vary being the thing that you're pointing this cause and effect finger at. Can you show me that study? Yeah. If so, how the hell did you get that passed an ethics committee? Yeah, that's the thing. I think, um, you know, to, I mean, to do anything like that, you'd have to have like, like the Truman set up, the Truman show set up, you know, mm. you have these people just, you know, controlled environment, stress free, mm. you know, life is good, just fed, you know, two different diets and just, you know, and that could last 150 years plus. So yeah. who the bloody hell knows? Mm. Um, so, you know, I always get, very uh you know dubious about these claims that um you know live a longer life you know um live you know uh, how not to die how not to age and all this sort of mm -hmm. ridiculous bogus claims yeah by either side really um and mm -hmm. it doesn't doesn't really matter who says it um yeah. but you know people like you know who have a series of books for example like gregor uh it, that's just utter nonsense yeah um everything gregor so, says is utter nonsense oh it, it's just a it's, it's just a clown uh, now and benefits of meat okay go far beyond uh like the tva long long chain fatty acids like um nutrient wise vitamin wise mm. uh it has everything that the human body needs mm. Uh, in the form that it needs it. it's not I'm not talking about overall generalization of vitamin um, or you know labels okay and the actual molecule that we can absorb and use comes from meat yes. now where do you stand on supplements right there's no nutritional supplementation necessary on a carnivore diet there is nothing yeah. missing yeah, nothing whatever. As such, I don't support nutritional supplementation as a standard practice. I would suggest to a person that a certain supplement or supplement regime might be indicated really case by case if there is a demonstrated deficiency. Yeah. But I've not seen that. In a carnivore eater there i haven't seen a deficiency in a carnivore eater that's a demonstrable deficiency yeah i do support a range of nutraceutical supplements if you like which are called nutritional supplements because the fda requires them to be labeled as something and that's what it is they do have one or two things in them like vitamins and herbal extracts and whatever else in a very yeah. small amount that doesn't concern me Mainly, I'm interested in this product line because of its effect on the human body, that being the release of adult stem cells from the bone marrow to the blood. Yeah. yeah. So I am joint ventured with that company. I support that company's product and I suggest it to everybody as an absolute thing that they should be involved in, not because I'll make a few dollars from the sale, although I will, but because if you understand what adult stem cells are and what they do then having more of them floating around in your bloodstream is an obvious no-brainer yeah yeah that's something i'm actually interested in um the stem cells i've heard that okay fasting will also stimulate uh, stem cell production from correct. your body correct in some um degree. to some degree yeah uh also heavy uh resistance training may, may do the same yes correct so, yeah to some degree 
When I was uh, going, after I'd finished my first sort of treatment as ARCHOP in 2012, I had my stem cells collected for my uh, autologous uh, stem cell transplant, which yeah. I had in 2014. Yeah. Uh, um, my viable stem cell count was 99.4%. Mm -hmm. Now, they they were extended by the... Um, that count themselves they okay. they thought it was pretty much over the you know just amazing mm. which I, well, I i had no idea at the time but i put it down to the fact that um i you know i was fasting through the treatment and yeah. um i also lived you know i've been lifting you know for many many years 30 plus years mm. um so i put it down to that and of course i do eat meat um, so do you think yep. that would be the the effect there? Well, look, without being able to prove a damn thing, I would suggest absolutely that it would be in line with my understanding and belief structure around all of these things to suggest that all of those things would have been extremely helpful in keeping your stem cell populations viable through a treatment which can be quite rough on those. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, for... A the two weeks before they took them, they did actually give me a supplement that actually helped me produce more more stem cells, right. which obviously would have helped as well. Uh, obviously, I couldn't have done it all by myself. But, um, yeah, so I, I thought that was quite interesting. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Um, but, but, again, your stance on um, nutritional supplementation yeah. is the same, much the same as mine. I don't agree with it because I don't I don't think that you need it for uh, for one because – you get everything you need from meat, uh, mm -hmm. especially if you eat fat, a lot of fat, um, mm -hmm. uh, which I do. Uh, but I don't. I don't want people to get off medications and simply swap it for medications uh, for supplements as well. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but basically, I, you know, a lot of supplements also have uh, soy lists and, and uh, other things in them as well, mm. which are just toxic uh you they don't they break down in your stomach acid anyway you can't absorb anything and as like we were uh, talking about before the generalization of these uh, these nutrients they just say vitamin d or vitamin k or vitamin a and so on and so on they don't mm. tell you which type and quite often the they're plant-based uh nutritional supplements yeah. especially these days yeah so i think they're absolutely uh just a waste of money honestly and yep. can be um working in the opposite having the opposite effect on your body also uh, so I, yeah so i yeah. i try to warn people about supplements because they they really do have the, uh, the opposite effect of what they want yeah um okay so hacks for 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 life yeah. um i i've heard you speak about that recently and uh so what are your i mean besides obviously the carnivore diet do you have mm. anything else yeah so i've mm. developed a list of five what i'm calling hacks and what these hacks really are, are that they are five behaviors which are in my top five because based on my experience with talking to many thousands of people over a number of years about this these are the five things that seem to have the most impact. Impact on what? Well, what we're talking about is inflammation status, your chronic systemic inflammation. Yeah. What you want to do is have that managed to as close to the zero level as possible. Acute inflammation when there are insults of various kinds, fine. But inflammation that persists for days and weeks and years on end, no good. So, here they are, in order of importance. Number one, a completely 100% carnivore diet. Based on the muscle meat and associated fat, mostly of large ruminant animals, but mix them up a bit. Have 20% non-beef in your diet. Fine. Yeah. Salt to taste, butter if you like it dairy plus or minus depending on how you react to it and whether it's a good thing for you or not same with eggs 
keep your electrolytes up, rest and repeat. Yeah. Right? That's number one. Yeah. Number two is that line of nutraceutical products I was referring to a few minutes ago. And there are three or four oral supplementation products from that company that I suggest people take on a daily basis. It's outlined in a video on my channel where I'm going like that, talking about these hacks and that there's five of them. Also, so that you can see the palm of my hand and see that I'm so trustworthy because... Yeah. All right. All right. So that's that's that. Take those products, take them every day, take them every single day, and never stop taking them. Great stuff because they have a stem cell release agent and anti inflammatory, a blood flow optimizer, and there's also a collagen peptide supplement if you're into that. And we have hydration electrolyte stuff if you're into that too. But the first three are the absolutes. We also have skincare, by the way, stem cell based skincare. It's brilliant stuff if people like that kind of thing. Um, that's a game for another day. So that's that. Number three is to spend as much time as is humanly possible electrically connected to the earth or grounded, if there's another way they call it. Yep. You can either do that directly by putting your skin on the ground or the grass growing in the ground but not on concrete so much or asphalt so much that kind of stuff yeah. uh, or sand dry sand not so good wet sand fine wet concrete fine um you can also do it indoors by using various commercially available electrical grounding bits of kit i have a mouse pad on my desk here which is electrically grounded uh, the bed that we sleep in is electrically grounded that takes out 18 hours a day for me, wow. that I'm grounded. Yeah. The only time I'm really not grounded is if I'm driving to cricket or home from cricket or leaving this property for some other reason, which is quite rare. Yeah. What is? Yeah. Um, the fourth most important thing is to disallow block, if you like, all blue wavelengths of light from your eyes after the sun has gone below the horizon that day and before it comes up the next morning. Yeah. So sleep when it's dark and wake when it's light. Well, or if you're going to use artificial light after dark, which most people do, then you would wear blue blocking lenses at night time to disallow the blue. Okay. Or the king of Tasmania, Harry Sopanos, has light bulbs with no blue wavelengths in them fitted throughout his house at $30 a light bulb or something. Well, good on you, Harry. <laughs> you can do that too if you like. Um... But that's what it is. And, and don't be sucked in by blue light blocking glasses for computers that don't distort the light. Yeah. Because if you can see blue, it's not blocked, is it? Yeah. Okay. It needs, they need to be amber colored lenses and there needs to be color distortion because otherwise it's not working. All right. Because uh, we block all blue wavelengths after dark and before morning. Right. It's to do with so your that helps with rhythm. improved sleep then. That your circadian rhythm at large, your melanopsin system. You know, there's a there's yeah. a throwback to to um, the natural way of light and dark cycles before yeah. technology messed that up for us. Yeah, it's circadian and the rhythm. Fifth thing on my list is the right amount of the right exercise at the right intensity on the right schedule. All right which is a topic for a whole discussion all by itself. Yeah. Luckily, absolutely. you'll notice that it's number five. Now, that's coming from an exercise physiologist first and foremost. Yeah. Exercise is number five on that list, not number one. Yeah. Or anywhere close to number one, as it turns out. There are also people that say to me, oh, what about this? What about that? What about the other thing? And I was, so I say, fine, if you want to try those things, put them into the mix, that's fine. If they work well, better for you than my experience with people at large so far good for you if it's not broken don't fix it hmm. but the reason it's not in my top five is because it's something i've considered that didn't make it so you yeah know, if you want to reinvent the wheel you go ahead and do that that's fine with me it's no skin off my nose no that's right but that's no, I'm all for that you know everyone should try things for themselves you yeah. know and it's the best way to learn yeah. um you know so and even even 
when it comes to diet, uh, even the carnivore diet, you're still going to have to play around with things that that work best for you. It doesn't matter how much great information you get, yeah. you still have to work out exactly what works for you. You know. Yeah. Um. So another thing, you know, you know going on when people start the carnivore diet and they get all excited and they start measuring everything. Yeah. Yeah. That. Uh. You know, like. <laughs> you know i could talk for ages about that but we'll, we'll start with ketones for example they've never measured them in their life but all of a sudden they get these pea strips and they, they they've been promised that when they're in um on carnival diet they they should be in ketosis and everything else so that their level on the pea strip should show their, their ketone levels really high mm. um but ketones okay if you Basically, what you're doing with its pea strips is that you're just peeing out what your body's not using. Is that about right? In effect, yes, when you're peeing out ketones, that is a loss of substrate. Absolutely. If you are a person that has been sucked into this ketones ideology and has ketone pea strips and is always interested to pee on them and see how purple you can make the thing go what i suggest you do is immediately throw those pea sticks in the bin in the rubbish never buy another set of pea sticks in your life never again test your pee for ketones ever because it will not provide you with any information of any utility whatsoever it's a waste of time and money it's 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 frankly a silly obsession yeah and you need to move off that yeah a well-designed fully carnivorous diet will actually have you dipping in and out of ketosis on a pretty much daily basis as you ought yeah it's eating yeah, once a day that we do that yeah i mean you still have to eat so you're going to dip out of ketosis when you eat that's right you're still going to have some sort of insulin reaction um so you know people obsessed with these things it just they're just you know they're obsessing about yeah. it. it's an addiction you know yeah, it's the same it as you know the same with the food addiction that we had before mm. on the uh, standard western diet yeah now before you said uh muscle meat yeah so you don't eat organs nope. That's another obsession people get when they go into carnivore diet. They say yeah. they have to get vitamins from organ meats. I don't Absolute believe so nonsense. because I think, yeah, I think so too because it, they, all those vitamins, obviously, they are very concentrated in, in the, uh, say, liver, for example, but other organs. Mm -hmm. But the fact is the vitamins that we need in the dose that we need come in the animal fat and the, the muscle meat itself yeah. and in the water-soluble vitamins as well. Yeah. So you you obviously have um you don't ever eat organs at all hardly at all hardly yeah, yeah. it's it's almost entirely muscle meat yeah mm. and you you haven't had any adverse reactions in the last 10 years well last tuesday my head fell off that was that was inconvenient for me um <laughs> I was turned into a newt, but I got better. No, nothing, nothing negative has happened really that I can. It's, it's been all positive, really. Yeah. The carnivore yeah. muscle meat. I don't believe. Diet. Yeah, I don't believe that people uh, killed an animal just to eat their organs. Um, and I think uh, that was usually left for the scavengers. Mm -hmm. you know? Or fed uh, directly and to the dogs. Or yeah, directly to the dogs because it's leaner meat. Dogs eat and you know, thrive on leaner meats, and we we thrive on the the fattier meats. Uh, I have noticed the same thing with cats. You know, with you know lions, tigers in the wild, for example, they eat fatty meat, and they leave the rest of the carcass, that all the organs, all the you know leaner stuff, that all gets left behind. So you know, I don't think that we are and we are hyper carnivores. We th thrive on fat. Mm -hmm. um, which is another thing that I try to emphasize to people is the fat because of our, when it comes to uh, hormone production and just general well being, our lymph lymphatic system is designed to absorb fat. Uh, or we have five different um, fat absorbing organs. But, uh, you know, plus 
you know, the lymphatic, uh, the lymph fluid, everything that goes up into the uh, the thymus, uh, hormone production, and I think that's also a source of poison when we eat the seed oils because we are designed to absorb fats, animal fats, that oils sneak in. Would that be correct? Well, it seems that the most important factor in terms of the body's response at large to the intakes of various chain lengths is the makeup of the chain length partitioned compartments, the short chain, the medium chain, the long chain, the polyunsaturated, the monounsaturated. It's yeah. it's a balance, balance issue to get this right. Yeah. Animal fat actually contains saturates, polyunsaturates, and monounsaturates, naturally. It's a mixture. When people say yeah. saturated animal fat, and I do it myself from time to time, saturated animal fat. No, animal fat is a mixture. It's largely saturated, but the other components are there in the right amount that doesn't set the inflammasome off. Concentrated extracted industrial seed oils from plants have that ratio completely out of whack. There's no saturates to speak of. Yeah. There's a huge amount of polyunsaturates with regard to monounsaturates. The N6 versus N3 ratio is vastly, vastly inflammatory. That's the problem. We are not designed to consume industrially extracted seed oils. That's right. That's not how we've evolved. Our body doesn't expect that. It's not geared up for that. That will cause us inflammation, and inflammation will cause our death sooner or later so there's an in direct imbalance of omega sixes and uh omega threes yeah yeah um now the effect of um you know, i was think uh listening to was it uh kayla daniel mm -hmm. talking about the you know, like even in small doses things like soy for example have a detrimental effect on our thyroid and hormone production so you know hence uh you get uh, man boobs and um, all sorts of things like that from soy, um, uh, along with a, a lot of other toxicity. Um, yeah, where, where's your stance on on that? Well, I have to be consistent and say, you know, if you're talking cause and effect in free living humans, you'll struggle to find the data. Yeah. If you want reductionist, mechanistic, here's how it could be occurring, and here are some anecdotes of people suffering that particular presentation great we yeah. can give you that but then antithesis will turn around and say well here's a bunch of people that eat soy that don't express that yeah so that's would be my stance is that i'm happy to admit it as a possibility yeah. i for one have plenty of reasons not to eat any plant material at all to speak of yeah i don't need another one yeah because the stuff i've got already is enough actually Okay, so yeah. would you ever uh, consider a protein supplement, for example? Probably not. There's no need to supplement protein if you're consuming sufficient muscle meat. Yeah. 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 Uh, I have, uh, I mean, I've, over the years, like especially when I was younger, uh, in the sports, you know, we, I, I, you know, obviously supplemented a lot of protein powder mm -hmm. and obviously sticking to the, the education of uh, lean proteins, of course, mm -hmm. uh, chicken breast and that sort of stuff. Um, but, you know, protein powders and supplements, um, pre-workout drinks and things like that, which you, know, you get uh, these vegan so-called athletes, mm -hmm. um, you know, you know promoting these days even plant-based ones which are you know full of these uh soy enhancements and things like that and other you know of these seed oils and whatnot yeah. um so i mean it, it's ironic they call themselves natural vegan athletes i i, I just call them processed athletes you know processed food athletes because that's basically all they are you see them take all these pre-workout drinks, protein powders, and everything else that you know that 
whatever. Um, yeah. But for me, I think um, these things are very accumulative. They they may be okay in one small dose, but no one takes one small dose, especially if you're an athlete, you're taking them daily mm -hmm. and things like that. So I, I find them quite toxic these days. Uh, as a, Again, it's all just heavily processed garbage. Yep. Uh, cooking. So uh organ meat's one thing what about mm. cooking a lot of people say uh in when they go carnival mm -hmm. that you cook it next to raw to get all the nutrients mm -hmm. um i cook it i i've always cooked my meat well done yeah. and I, I don't have any problem right um basically you know cooking cooking the um the meat will also suppress um uh, glutamine Okay, mm -hmm. for which you know is also another sh source of sugar for for cancer. So, where's your stance on the you know overall generally cooking meat for the carnival? Yeah. Okay. So, for there to be a need or an indication for people to eat the meat raw, there would have to be a clear, unmistakable, absolutely patent difference in outcomes for people who eat cooked meat versus people who eat raw meat yeah does any such distinction exist the answer is no the argument is finished yeah. i eat all my meat pretty well cooked as well yeah no deficiencies no deficiencies yeah mm. and no cancer yeah. i'm aware of either yeah well if you already got it <laughs> yeah yeah um yeah, I agree. Uh, I haven't had any deficiency. In fact, uh, all of my markers have gone up over the you know the course of the carnival diet. So mm. it's um, it's done nothing but improve for me. So yeah, I just continue to cook it. Well done. Correct. If it's not broken, it doesn't need fixing. No, that's right. Mm. Uh, so another thing, you're okay, as an exercise physiologist. A lot of people going to carnival are concerned about uh, energy levels and uh, building muscle. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And recovery is another thing. Um, I have noticed myself after even after heavy lifting in the gym, it's quite intense workout. I don't have as much muscle soreness. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you get you know, the muscles get a bit stiff, it mm -hmm. might get a bit tight, and you sort of loosen up, have a stretch, everything's good. Mm -hmm. Um, so we'll start with that one. why do you think there is less muscle soreness, for example? does that mean less growth i can only guess at it that less sense of pain and discomfort involved around the doms that you get after exercise would suggest a lowered chronic systemic inflammatory status in the first instance perhaps from your diet it might indicate that your level of adaptation to the intensity and makeup of your exercise sessions is such that it's no longer a stress on your body to that level ergo you might need to swap and change change your program up change your splits change something to get your body guessing again do some yep. big negatives do some drop sets do some pyramid sets throw in some other things just to so that your body doesn't know what's coming next i guess yep get enough recovery decent recovery between training sessions i suggest to people that three to four training sessions a week is quite sufficient and under no circumstances should you train every day of your life let alone multiple times a day i think that the issues that people have with their exercise are usually borne out as too much volume in fact and not enough intensity in fact yeah yeah um and that tweaking those things around generally tends to solve any issues around growth continued adaptation etc and so it's one of those rich tapestry things that you just kind of react to in an aha fashion and just correct everything that you think might be off all at once and if all of that together works just keep doing all of that stuff yeah okay yeah yeah and again uh supplements uh completely unnecessary correct for, for muscle growth correct yeah i mean all you need is protein and and fats you know yeah yeah exactly so you know that's i mean a lot of people's concerns uh, and you know i don't think i mean for my own 
transition onto carnival. You know, I did have uh, a loss of energy at first, um, and even a, you know, quite a dramatic loss of weight. But I think that is a very temporary sort of thing. Um, when people do transition, what do you think is the best method or the healthiest method? Whatever you're going to change your diet to from whatever it was before, you should always make that change slowly over six to eight weeks in my mind. You should never hammer yeah. over and change your diet overnight. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, insulin is another thing. Uh, there's another study uh, came out recently. They, they actually called it like insulin-lowering diet. Like they didn't want to call it carnivore diet, but... Uh, and was, we sort of we spoke about that before. You know, you do you, you do dip in and out of ketosis, whether you're on uh, carnival or not. Uh, every time you eat, you sort of you get an insulin spike, even a small one. But if you exercise, when you exercise, you also get an insulin spike. Is that correct? You can do, yeah. 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 So um, a lot of uh, like gym culture, for example, they're trying to. Um, force protein into the, the muscle cells by because they do get an insulin re reaction to heavy training they will eat something sweet for example um to spike insulin and to force more protein yeah. into the okay. into the muscles right. yeah right just because we're short on time let's shorten this one right down because i can yeah. do this one real quickly for you here it is the whole point of exercise is to subject your body to a minor injury to yeah. push it beyond its current limits of capacity in some way yeah. and thereafter to allow your body to heal from that injurious situation such that it heals itself just that bit better than it was before you injured it so that next time you impose that same stimulus hopefully that injury doesn't occur that's what getting fitter is yeah so if you do everything possible to shorten down the recovery time to lessen the stress that your body has expressed as a result of that exercise all you are doing probably is attenuating the training response yeah. so i wouldn't be doing that stuff any of it no 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 i agree hence you you don't do not need supplementation you do not need these pre-workout post-workout in between meals and um you know whatever else that you know you you take with these you know it's just a waste of money the fitness exactly. industry i think is one of the the biggest perpetrators of bad health actually mm. so, yes anyway. superseded only by the medical establishment yes exactly but yes. it's all related isn't it you know it's all yep. pharmaceutical you know made yeah you know, it's all made by pharmaceuticals Absolutely. whether you get this is what i keep telling people if you you're swapping medications for supplements you're still you're still feeding the pharmaceutical company you know either way yep. so all right my man all right. i'm out of time unfortunately Excellent. i have to race off to the next the next victim as it were um, it's been <laughs> a pleasure thank you Thanks very for much me. for your time all right. absolute pleasure. thank you cool. all right cheers okay so that was my conversation with bart k now we covered I think quite a great deal in just a, a very short period. Um, pretty much anything you need, actually starting the carnivore diet to uh, working up to exercise training and uh, supplements and and pretty much you know testing yourself as well. You know, there's a, a lot of people wasting money on supplements, for example, ketone measuring ketones and all the rest of it. Unless you have a specific need, they're just you really are just wasting money so um that i think is uh like a great summarization from uh, professor uh, bart k and i look forward to talking to him again actually a brilliant guy and uh, and a really good guy so all right guys i hope you all had uh, uh well got some great information out of that there was quite a lot in there for you to um to have a look at so Please don't forget to like, subscribe, and there will be a lot more information coming for you very soon. All right, guys, have a great day or night, wherever you are, and I shall see you again.